Some time back, a good friend asked how Vietnam had changed me. I looked him in the eye, but didn't have a good answer. I suppose I hadn't thought about it very deeply. The United States is becoming more fully involved with each passing day. American combat troops join with South Vietnamese and Australian forces in a search-and-destroy offensive against a red base in Zone D. This is the jungle area, 25 to 50 miles northeast of Saigon, which is the main staging base for terror raids against the capital. Tonight, I'd like to share with you some memories, reflections, photographs, all related directly or indirectly to my time in Vietnam, the odd path by which I got there, what I did there, how things have played out since then, my journey, if you will. Now we wonder if it was even worthwhile. Of course, back then, we had a much different perspective. Jungle fighting is a dangerous and frustrating affair. In the steaming jungle, you are always damp or wet, and you rarely see the enemy, but you feel him all around you. The other guys in the medevac chopper had head wounds. I had a wounded arm and I felt damn lucky. Man, I ain't even want to go. I was drafted. Next thing I know, I'm pushing freaking howitzers around the jungle. Perhaps the telling of the tale will give me some new insights into why I made some of the choices you'll hear about and give you a different perspective on how military service can affect at least have one old boy and perhaps someone else you know well. November 2011, Al Smith, the fellow Vietnam vet, asked if I'd like to join him and a few other guys and watch the Veterans Day Parade along Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. I agreed, though I'm not much of a parade goer. After the parade, we made our way to a midtown gin mill for some liquid refreshments. Now that I can do. The guys are in good spirits as we sat around the table, lots of smiles, laughter, stories of course. But one fellow, we'll call him John, didn't share in all that. He had kind of a long face. John's a good man, Wyoming boy, no nonsense, B-52 pilot. His plane had been hit by a SAM missile while on a bombing mission over North Vietnam. He and the crew managed to guide the crippled plane out over the South China Sea, where they safely ejected and were rescued. I leaned over and asked John if anything was wrong. He said his wife Annie had left him, gone back to Canada, said a bank was about to foreclose on his home. John has a substantial business background, but at that point did not have a suitable position. My mind raced back to a number of disastrous personal loans I'd made to friends over the years, people I knew much better than John, and I had said, hey, this ain't happening again, never, never again. But there was John, sitting across the table. He had given so much, almost given his life. Somehow this was different. I almost felt as if I owed him. John, would a $5,000 no interest loan help you get over the hurdle? He nodded. Pay me back when you can. John had a private security gig for a while, but has since moved down south. My hope is that he can turn his life around. He deserves a break. He'll pay what he can, when he can, if he can. And that's just fine with me. When I got out of college in 64, Johns Hopkins University, I had an impractical sort of bachelor's degree, one with a concentration in political science. Now, what are you going to do with that? 
My dad played a lawyer in a high school play. <laughs> that, that seemed to count for a lot with my grandparents. Totally, you was wonderful on stage. Play good actor, make good actor, make good lawyer, make good living. Did they want me to be an actor or a lawyer? In any case, come the spring of 67, I was finishing up at Cornell Law School, taking a final semester course in legal ethics and thinking about what lay up ahead, as in, what the hell do I do now? My professor, a starchy, waspy fellow named Gray Thoron, big Republican fundraiser and kingmaker in Texas, had asked each of us to write a paper on something or other. Late one night, a very, very bad idea came to me, and I started to type. For some reason, I focused upon Professor Thoron and how his early marriage that did not go the distance somehow disqualified him from evaluating a paper of mine on an ethical matter. Well, how stupid is that? I can't imagine what my thread of logic was at the time. More importantly, writing a paper like that could have been a very dangerous thing for me to do. I ranked much closer to the bottom of the class than the top. Writing a paper like that could have threatened my very graduation. Why would I write it? Why would I submit the damn thing? I consulted with a good buddy of mine up at Cornell, one Michael Callahan, a quiet, introspective lad, and he said, what the hell are you doing? Write something else, anything else. I turned the paper in. Professor Thoron did indeed give me a grade for the course. B plus, that's B as in Barry, not D as in dog. I've sometimes wondered, though, if the good professor was giving me a necessary lesson in humility. Looking to the future, I went for an interview with a law firm in Rutland, Vermont. Pastoral, life in the country, Norman Rockwell kind of place. What's not to like? Took a bus over from Ithaca on a Sunday morning. Waited outside the building as instructed until my interviewer, a partner in the firm, came back from his morning hunting expedition. Wildebeests, gazelles, emus, I don't recall. We had a nice chat. Eventually, though, I confessed. I confessed that I had a military obligation staring me in the face. This was 1967. There was a draft. Not a lottery, not a volunteer army, a full-blown draft. After law school, I had to go into the military. My interviewer did not seem phased by my confession. He implied that I could get a slot in a Coast Guard Reserve unit in Vermont. Oh, oh, Coast Guard, I, I didn't know. Vermont, I see, yes, yes. What the hell was he talking about? Coast Guard in Vermont? Patrol what? Shorelines. Vermont is landlocked. Back at Cornell, I consulted with my guru, Callahan. We concluded that I would have been searching for VC, Viet Cong, along the shores of Lake Champlain. Turns out, the Coast Guard was active in Vietnam, not happily embraced by the Navy, but active. Small craft in the Mekong Delta in the south Larger ships in the South China Sea trying to stop what I call the bad guys from mining Saigon Harbor. And as I wrote this show, I began to wonder, did that Coast Guard Reserve unit from Vermont ever get called up to active duty and serve in Vietnam? That would have been a bit of irony. But no, no, didn't happen, not in Vermont or any other state. That summer in 67, I failed the California bar exam by a whisker. Having passed the exam would not have freed me from the draft, but having to wait several years before retaking the exam was certainly going to make that exercise more challenging. The New York draft board was nipping at my heels. They had already sent me one cordial invitation to report for induction. Thinking that I would rather go into the military as an officer than as an enlisted man, I flew down to Texas. Lackland Air Force Base. There, I met with an officer in charge of recruitment for an intelligence program. Now, Stuart, I must tell you that my next training program will not begin for three months. That would seem to pose a problem with your draft board. I doubt they will wait that long. Indeed, 
my draft board was on the case. They sent me a second notice of induction. This one had a different flavor, a bit more insistent. Now, I'm not suggesting they were going to send uh, Vinnie and Angelo with a couple of bats to convince me or something. No, 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 of course not. But it was clear that my time for exploration of alternatives had expired. So on the appointed day, I showed up at a local American Legion post, along with the other draftees. We were herded onto a bus, taken to someplace on Whitehall Street in Manhattan for a physical exam, then back on the bus and out to Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn where I raised my hand and I said, I do. Well, I was in the Army now. No question about that. Rich or poor, fat or sleek, geek or stud, the soldier to be is treated to, ba <laughs> to basic training. The idea, I think, is to reduce everybody to a common neutral. A zero. Take away the fat, remove the macho, introduce a dab of self-doubt, then into that malleable blob, inject new thoughts and skills. This process of reduction and reconstruction can be deadly serious, of course, but in the midst of it all, there can be some funny moments, at least in retrospect. Along with a few hundred other guys, I was flown from New York down to Columbia, South Carolina, Fort Jackson. Well, that was the first tip-off. They wanted me to suffer culture shock. And after I'd heard them say, hey there, Billy Joe, Ray Bob, a few dozen times, I knew they'd succeeded. I was convinced that long before basic training would end, I was going to die of terminal redneck. We were quickly hustled over to a medical facility for a bunch of shots. In fact, for the next eight weeks, about everything we did was followed by a shot. Run a mile, take a shot. Clean your weapon, take a shot. Go to the head, take a shot. Take a shot, take a shot. And there was always this big rusty syringe lying around just to keep our adrenaline flowing. Well, 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 maybe, I think there was a small syringe. The next morning, we were off to see the barber. Now, this proved to be like castration for some. Picture the tough guy, his hair long and all slicked back, the fashion of the day for some. Now enter the barber, not exactly a graduate of a trendy salon. Morning, boy, how can I help you? Maybe left log on the sides, touch off the top. Huh? You want what? You want it tapered. He, he, he wants it tapered. <laughs> Bubba, he wants it tapered. Sure, son, we can do that for you. That what they do up in New York City. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> How am I doing, boy? <laughs> You're done. Now get your scrony, untapered ass out of my chair. The kid, no longer a tough guy, left the chair like the rest of us. His hair was gone, shoulders seemed lower, voice was softer, and his macho had gone south. A few days later, my new buddy Jesse and I were down at the rifle range. While we were waiting for our turn to practice, we were volunteered. Wonderful Army institution. We were volunteered to rake the local stones and dirt as if this were some Civil War estate speckled with unsightly leaves. After a while, Jesse stopped, looked over at me as if to say, what the hell are we doing? Fair question. But about that time, one of our training sergeants came by and gently inquired into the reason for Jesse's lack of progress. Boy, why ain't your ass in gear? Jesse, a Boston lawyer, uh, Sergeant, do you know what I'd be doing if I wasn't here? Not a good answer. The sergeant compressing a great deal of philosophy into very few words. <laughs> but boy, 
This is where you at. Ah, we rake pretty well after that. Lesson learned. But there were ways to get out of chores. Saturday mornings were reserved for inspection. That meant a lot of cleaning, polishing of brass, general abuse from your superiors. About the only way to get the hell out of all that was to get involved in a religious exercise of some kind. Buddhist, Catholic, Jewish, whatever, this was no time to be quibbling over who was right. One Saturday morning, a DI, our drill inspector, was awfully pissed off as he gave his pre-inspection address. I wants the following men's to step forward now. Jones, E, Brown, R, Rashad, X, huh, uh, and on and on. Tough group of streetwise black guys from New York City stepped forward in response. They had all just signed up for choir practice. Well, that was funny to the rest of us, and we thought it was pretty clever. The DI, though, he, he didn't see the humor. You men done fooled the chaplain, but you ain't fooled my black ass. Retribution seeming imminent, <laughs> the zealots reconsidered and lost their fervor within moments. Oh, it was a miracle. Basic training made us all equal, equally miserable, but it had its moments. After basic, I was sent to Fort Gordon, Georgia to be a clerk. There I pushed papers in a so-called special processing detachment, a unit for guys who had gone AWOL but who are now back in the loving arms of Uncle Sam. Some of these guys returned voluntarily, others were picked up by local police around the southeast. Every week a new batch of these guys would arrive on a big old army bus. And after a while I came to see some commonalities. Most were young, lacking higher education, and homesick. But now they were going to have to face the music. They would be tried in a military court, found guilty of having been absent without leave, AWOL. Then each would be one, returned to his unit, or two, discharged from the army, or three, in the case of long-term absence, desertion, imprisonment at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay, not all my time was spent with AWOLs at Fort Gordon. A few of the clerks I worked with were black guys, and uh, one of them said to me, uh, Stewie, how about going downtown with me tonight? By downtown, he meant the black section of Augusta, as in <laughs> no white guys on the horizon. That was a bit disconcerting. But uh, I summoned all my courage, gave it my best John Wayne, and said, Okay. <laughs> so that night, four or five of us piled into his car and downtown we went. We go into some club. First thing I see, big old sign, check your weapons at the bar. Oh, oh, what am I doing to myself? Well, we go past the bar into a large room. Hundreds of people, live music, dancing, singing, cigarettes being smoked. Glasses clinking, people enjoying themselves. So, we decided to sit down and have a few pops. Not hard to do. And, that, and then over my left shoulder, I noticed a very good looking girl sitting with her friends at the next table. Hi, hi there, hi. I decided I was going to make a pitch. Now, now I had to be very drunk to do something like this. In the first place, I had never approached a black girl for any kind of date before. Second, there were only two honkies in the place and we were both seated at the same table. Third, this was 1968. Martin Luther King had just been shot a few months before. Not a great time for race relations. Uh, Stewie, if you uh, get a chance for a quickie, I will loan you my car. How can I say no? I make my pitch. 
and off we went. I was excited and nervous, both. Still, I'd like to get me some cigarettes. <laughs> uh, whatever, you, whatever you say. So we stopped. She goes into some place for cigarettes, and my excitement level is rising. I know I was seated, but at least one part of me was standing at attention. Oh, she's, co she's coming back. Stewie, <laughs> oh, I'd like to go back to the club. No, 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 you can't now. We haven't had a chance to uh, uh, get to uh, know each other, know, know each other. Stewie, you a sweet boy, but you ain't my type. I want to go back to the club now. Back we go. She goes to her table. I go to mine. Uh, Stewie, did you score with Black Beauty? Uh, no, no, no. Stewie, did you at least get a hand job from Black Beauty? Uh, no, no. Stewie, did you know what you were doing? I thought I did. Well, it is my duty to inform you, uh, <laughs> how shall I put this, that uh, she is a he. Say what? While you were gone, some folks from that table over there came over and made clear that she is a he. I'll be a son of a bitch. But I had dodged a bullet. And I was still in Georgia. <laughs> An old high school classmate of mine, we'll call him Jeffrey, had gone through basic training with me at Fort Jackson and was now there with me at Fort Gordon as well. Jeffrey was developing what I would call an allergy to military service. <laughs> he never expressed any moral objection to the war, but he did walk around with his head down saying, I don't belong here, I don't belong here. Newsflash, none of us thought we belonged there either. This was not home sweet home. After a while, Jeffrey added a sentence to his monologue. I can't take it. I don't belong here. I can't take it. I don't belong here. Well now, in my own humble medical opinion, Jeffrey had progressed to a full-blown case of post-traumatic stress disorder without having suffered any stress or any trauma. A remarkable case indeed. Somehow, Jeffrey found his way to a sympathetic army shrink. Poof, gone was the hangdog look. Now Jeffrey smiled as he told us the shrink wanted to help him get out of the army. And sure enough, one day he announced that his discharge papers had been signed. He had done it. He had actually done it. He had done what Corporal Maxwell Klinger couldn't. The night before Jeffrey was to fly away, he took a room at a motel right next to the Augusta airport. Taking no chances, didn't want to miss that morning flight. A few of us went out there to drink some goodbyes with him. No trauma for Jeffrey that night. He was a happy camper, as normal as the rest of us. We laughed, drank, sent his ass back to New York. I've sometimes wondered, though, how Jeffrey described his military experience to his family, to his business associates, to himself. What did he put on his resume? Did he tell his kids he was a conscientious objector? As far as my buddies were concerned, Jeffrey had simply concocted a story to avoid military service. Perhaps someone else took his place in Vietnam. Perhaps that someone else died in his place. After four or five months at Fort Gordon, I decided I wanted to go to Vietnam. Not a matter of patriotism, wasn't trying to be a hero, wasn't even sure we should have been over there. But I had this odd feeling that I would regret having spent two years of my life in the military if those years were spent in backwater places rather than where world history was being made. 
Now ordinarily, the army would be happy to oblige. Step right up, soldier. Good moan in Vietnam. But I had these two buddies, Dave Myers, Kenny Gasparez. Dave was from Norman, Oklahoma. Kenny was a Cajun boy. Both these fellas were low-level enlisted people, just like me. But they worked in personnel. Those were the folks who made up the lists called levies by which soldiers were assigned to one place or another around the world. Guys, put me on a levy for Nam. No, no, yes. Now, but I want to go. You get your kill desk to it. I ain't going to do that to you. Come with us, Taiwan. Isn't that ironic? If I had wanted not to go to Vietnam, do you think I would have known these guys? I submitted a form to volunteer. The next levy came out. My name was not on it. Dave and Kenny had kicked it off. Guys, I want to go. Oh. So in early December 1968, my name was on orders to report to the Oakland Army Air Terminal. Next stop, Republic of Vietnam. Robert P. O'Neill was a classmate of mine at Cornell Law School. We called him Pinky. Still do. 77-year-old practicing attorney in New York City, and we call him Pinky. Some of us just won't grow up. Pinky had also made his way to Vietnam. He was a clerk at Long Bin, huge base outside of Saigon, housing over 40,000 U.S. troops. Long Bin was the site of a ferocious Viet Cong attack during the Tet Offensive of 68. Now, for some reason, I had sent Pinky a copy of my orders for Nam. Turns out, though, he was headed back to the States when I arrived at Long Bin in January of 69. Now, when you checked into the country at Long Bin, you had to wait around a couple of days to get your next assignment. Here's the way that worked. Every day, two or three times a day, all the newly arrived enlisted men, snakes as we were called, <laughs> lowest form of life on earth, we were lined up in a large open dirt field, maybe three, four hundred guys. An announcer would call out the names of perhaps a hundred guys and the name of the division to which they were being assigned, 101st Airborne, 25th Infantry Division, 1st Air Cavalry, and so on. And then those guys would toddle off to their destiny. Now comes the important part. A clerk would walk around, tap about a dozen guys on the shoulder, and tell them this was their lucky day. They were going to be on KP, kitchen police. That meant lots of very large, heavy pots and pans to wash, hot water, Hot kitchen, hot country, eight to ten hour shift, not what you wanted to do with your free time. I decided that I could attend these announcements but not go on to the field with everybody. I hung around the outer edges within earshot, bent over, picking up stray pieces of paper here and there, moving dirt and pebbles around, acting as if this were a Civil War estate, speckled with unsightly leaves. Now, that was my practice for maybe two or three days. And if my name had been called out for division, I, I would have gone off. I would have toddled off to my destiny. But when they started to anoint the KP crew, I slipped away in the mist. And that was my practice for a couple of days. And then finally, the announcer called out a list of three people, not a hundred. Not a dozen, just three, uno, dos, tres, and my name was one. I was thinking, oh dear, uh, uh, volunteerism has run amok. I'm going to be sent on some suicide mission. So with some trepidation, I walked up to the announcer and, and he said, Stu? Who was he talking to? I hadn't heard my first name in a while. I was used to being called Specialist Reichel, Specialist Ritual, or some other variation. Yeah, 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 I, I'm Stu. Well, but, 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 Pinky said you're coming. Pinky, 
He did, did he? I'll be a son of a bitch. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're, we're going to keep you here. It's, it's, it's safe, safe now. Well, at that critical moment, I must have concluded that Longman would have been pretty much the same as Fort Gordon, that history was being made down the road. Look, I appreciate what you're trying to do for me. I, I do. But I want to go forward. You, 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 you are fucked up, fucked up. Next day, my name was called out for real. First Infantry Division. Along with a handful of other guys, I was put aboard a cargo plane. No first class seats. No business class seats. No seats at all. We were human cargo. Butts on the floor, backs to the frame of the plane. The noise of the engines was loud. So loud you could barely hear yourself even if you shouted. No peanuts, no, no cookies, no complimentary beverages. What was going on? The flight was to last about 20 minutes north to Lyke, a small village in the middle of an old French rubber plantation, but now headquarters of the 1st Infantry Division. After maybe 10, 15 minutes, I happened to look over my right shoulder out a window. An engine was on fire, billowing black smoke, orange flames shooting out. Ah, uh, stewardess, <laughs> no, 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 no stewardess on this flight. I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I can assure you I was not smiling. The flight continued. The plane continued. The flames continued. The plane touched down. Captain and crew got their butts out of there in a heartbeat long before the human cargo got our asses off the flight. Welcome to Lyke. Hey. Military Occupation Specialty 71D20 Legal Clerk, sir. I was assigned to a Judge Advocate General's office where I transcribed court martial proceedings, trials for soldiers who had been accused of having committed some offense while in Vietnam. Sure, the stakes were higher for these guys than for most of the AWOLs back at Fort Gordon. But I was still pushing papers, and I suppose I wanted something more. I learned about a unit called the Public Information Office, or PIO. Those guys wrote stories, took pictures, published a newspaper for the soldiers of the 1st Infantry Division. I must have conveyed the impression to my commanding officer that a change of scenery would be useful. <laughs> and he must have agreed because I was promptly transferred to PIO. Didn't know anything about photography. Still don't, truly. But I felt that I could write, describe, convey thoughts, and snap some photos, even if they were not going to be of art gallery quality. So presto, combat correspondent. My job was to record the happenings of that division as it operated in an area from Lai K north to the Cambodian border. I lived with went on patrol with the soldiers of that division and their Vietnamese counterparts. Sometimes I carried a weapon along with my camera, sometimes I didn't. Finally, out in the field. The VC used rivers to transport men and supplies. U.S. Navy used small, heavily armed crafts to patrol the river and catch the bad guys in the act. South Vietnamese Navy used old French naval craft. On one occasion, I was out with a, an infantry unit working in support of a joint U.S.-South Vietnamese operation on the Saigon River. If some VC were spotted trying to cross the river at night, a patrol boat would roar out into the river, open up the machine gun, and end the crossing. But the VC were smart. They soon learned that if a patrol boat went up the river, eventually it would have to go back down the river. So they might avoid contact on the way up, but on the way back, they'd be hidden in the reeds some distance back from the bank of the river. They'd fire an RPG, rocket-propelled grenade, a big fat grenade 
with a fin sticking out the back for stability during flight. Fired from a tube that would be resting over a guy's shoulder. So they'd fire one of these things, then DD Mao. Or in English, get the hell out of there. <laughs> the RPG was not likely to hit the patrol boat, but it would certainly get your attention as it whooshed on by. In response, Americans would send troops ashore. Anticipating this, the VC would set up booby traps at expected points of landing. So the next sound you heard might be an explosion if a good guy hit a tripwire. But there was magic on the river one night. July 20, 1969, beautiful, clear, quiet night on the Saigon River. Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin. In the oddest of juxtapositions, there we were, in the middle of a war zone, in a serene moment, listening to radio reports as Neil Armstrong left the lunar landing module and walked on the moon. We were spellbound, transfixed as we stared up at that moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. On another occasion, I was out with an armored unit. Introduced myself to the commanding officer, got permission to hitch a ride aboard one of his APCs, armored personnel carriers. Bulky steel vehicles that rolled along on tracks like a tank. But these were kind of hollow inside, designed more to carry troops than to engage the enemy in direct combat. They did, though, have a nasty looking machine gun or two sending out the nose there. When I went out on these operations, most times I didn't know where we were going or what we were likely to encounter. I certainly had no need to know, as they say. In this case, we were out in the jungle in an area called the Iron Triangle. Suddenly, there was small arms fire nearby. Our unit had come across an underground enemy hospital complex. The rifle fire was coming from some VC who were trying to delay the arrival of American troops so their buddies could get away through a series of tunnels and trenches. Did our military brass know the complex was there or just stumble on it? I don't know. But I think there's a good chance they were acting upon military intelligence. The APC on which I was riding stopped at the entrance to a tunnel. While the brass was deciding what to do, I volunteered to go in. Me. 71D20 legal clerk, what the hell did I know about tunnels? I certainly knew nothing about booby traps, but there I was, stumbling around, talking, acting like a dunce, like a booby. While the brass was deciding what to do, I volunteered to go in, and in I went. Didn't take more than a few steps before I found a weapon, nothing high tech, no AK-47, just an old single-shot rifle. But now that was my rifle, my war trophy. I carried it out proudly. An officer sitting up on a tank directed me to hand it over. I complied, of course. Never saw the weapon again. And I'd be less than amused if that weapon is now properly mounted and hanging over a fireplace in that officer's home. Back into the tunnel I went. This time I found an old, heavy, wooden-handled sickle, maybe 10, 12 pounds. Out I marched with my farm tool. No officer showed any interest this time, and that sickle is in my closet today, my last line of defense if the North Koreans attack Manhattan. As for the VC, they left some of their wounded behind. They simply abandoned their soldiers. I suppose they didn't want anything to slow down their own escape, or perhaps they thought we'd give their wounded better medical attention than they would. In any case, the wounded VC could look forward to some very aggressive questioning at the hands of their South Vietnamese brothers. And sometimes that questioning took place in choppers, way, way up in the sky.
danger was not equally distributed in Vietnam. Your risk, I think, depended upon what you were doing, where, and when. Example, another old chum of mine, one Robert Ira Kaczynski, or Cooch, was an officer in the military police stationed in Saigon. Cooch lived in an old French villa, nice digs. I saw the place, and he had maid service. I think Cooch would agree that his timing was impeccable. He arrived in Saigon one month after the Tet Offensive of 1968. That was when the VC and North Vietnamese armies came out of the woodwork and attacked towns, cities, outposts all over the country, including the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. We had over 500,000 troops on the ground, but were surprised by the breadth of this offensive. That's hard for me to understand. Now, to be clear, the VC lost a ton of men in this little exercise of about a month, maybe 40, 45,000, no cakewalk for them. But the Tet Offensive of 68 was a huge political embarrassment for the administration in Washington. Like Cooch, I had more than my fair share of breaks in timing as well, or else I don't think I'd be here. But some guys always seem to be in harm's way. Medevac, chopper pilots, by definition flying into hot, dangerous landing zones. Dog handlers who, along with their German shepherds, were leading patrols in the jungle trying to find tripwires, buried munitions. The enemy itself, and they were often the first to be seen by the enemy. Tunnel rats. Crazy little guys who'd go into these holes and tunnels dug by the VC to hide munitions, underground living quarters, underground hospital complexes. Imagine crawling into a tiny hole, sometimes no room to turn around, and you crawl forward slowly in the darkness with just a pistol and a flashlight. What's up ahead? Talk about courage. I have to tell you, though, that I had a special degree of affection and admiration for the infantrymen. The poor fellow who was slogging around through the mud, the jungle, the rice paddies, always with the risk of ambush just around the corner. The fellow who didn't have the connections to get into a reserve unit back home. The fellow who had a long history of military service. The fellow who wasn't the sort to while away the hours in a coffee house praising Jane Fonda's visit to North Vietnam. When I was over in Nam, I wrote an essay in praise of the infantrymen. It got picked up by a rag called the Overseas Weekly. I'd like to read a chunk of it to you. His body is covered not with modern fashion, but with the rags and grime of war. To remove the stain, he looks to his sleeve or a towel around his neck, not fortunate enough to have greater convenience at hand. The clouds around him are hardly silver lined. They're laden with rain, makers of mud. Their only redeeming value is as a buffer, stopping the sun from mercilessly bearing down. When rain appears, he retreats to the sanctity of a disciplined mind and listens to the patter of the drops on his head, not a roof. And while others bathe, he scrounges to drink. Water is sometimes too precious to waste on keeping the body clean. As if to tease, the sun will replace the unbearable rain and dry the feet, sore and rotted. The grunt takes it, doing what he must, doing whatever he can against the elements. He warms his food, if at all, with the heat from stick-like explosives. Fruit cocktail and pound cake are delicacies, much the same as snails or caviar to the beautiful people. His food is tolerable, but 
becomes tiresome after nine or ten months of similarity. Don't speak of loneliness to him. He knows it too well. Don't preach about losses and the meaning of death. He can count higher than you. And no one has undergone more of the experiences which make a guy cherish life and what it has to offer. He has lived and fought with great friends, some of whom will return home. But he notes the irony that those who live, live only to return to riots, bloodshed, despair, or perhaps hope. Don't speak to him of race. The blood his brother shed was real, and not strangely was red as his. When life was on the line, colors blended. After all, colors won't stop a well-aimed round. Speak to him of nice things. Scream about living and life itself. Whisper about people, love, and softness. He is a human being who wants to leave the name Grunt and Leg behind him in the dim past where such history belongs. His personal victory is simply in terms of leaving Vietnam. He has finished his tour. No more chalking off days on a calendar. Now, his future lies with his folks, his girl, his job, his world. That world should thank him and let him go on his way. Give him the respect he merits. Let him pick up the pieces and move on to a new and fruitful life. As an infantryman, he has earned his place out of the sun. He deserves no less. One day, my commanding officer offered a few of us a weekend pass to Saigon. He did not have to ask twice. Our hormones were raging. We needed to visit the ladies of Saigon. One of the guys hustled us a chopper ride down there. This guy was something else. Always wheeling, dealing, buy this, sell that, God bless him. When we got down there, our first stop was at a French Vietnamese restaurant. We hadn't seen a restaurant in a while, hadn't had a nice meal in a while. Sauces, desserts, aromas, wonderful. But all the while, that other appetite was growing. So when the meal was over, we toddled on around the corner to Ye Olde Massage Parlor. In we went. Off came the clothes, hot showers, steam baths, were escorted upstairs wearing only a towel. Large rooms separated into cubicles. In each cubicle, a table. I lay down upon my table. Visions of sugar plums and other things dancing through my head and a pretty Vietnamese girl walks in and she comes over and starts to massage my scalp. Oh boy, I'm, I'm looking forward to satisfaction. And she starts to go toward my neck and then down, heading south, oh yeah. But after a few minutes, you could hear from each of the cubicles, what the hell do you mean you're done? We had walked into the only honest-to-goodness massage parlor in Saigon. You couldn't find one of those if you tried. Sometimes you just can't catch a break. <laughs> now, I'm not breaking news when I tell you that some American universities set up satellite campuses in towns and cities around their home state. Some go overseas, Asia, Europe, Middle East. But Vietnam, with a war raging? Yep, University of Maryland, Far East Division, did just that. Set up shop in Lai K, home of the 1st Infantry Division. Large campus, ivy-walled buildings, fraternity houses. Come on now, 
I'm fibbing. I'm kidding you. There were two trailers. One was administrative, one was the classroom. Somehow I learned about this school, and I thought I might like to teach business law. But first, I had to round up some references. Gray Thoron, my divorced ethics professor? I think not. But imagine my old professor of criminal law, W. David Curtis, as he read this strange note from a former student wanting to teach in the jungle. Years later, I learned that Professor Curtis had himself served in World War II in Europe. I wonder what he was thinking as he read my note. And, and then there's this teacher from Augusta College from whom I had taken a course in principles of education while stationed at Fort Gordon. He wrote the nicest note saying that I had gotten a B plus in his course, but had I not left early for Vietnam, I was headed for an A. Now the students. Some of these guys were chopper pilots, lives on the line, and if all went well, back in the base camp at night. Other guys, missions of two, three, four days in the field, and then back in the base camp. I thought the tenacity of these guys was, was admirable, going after an education under these circumstances. And here's a twist. Some of the students were officers. Now, as an enlisted man, I'm not authorized to give an order or direction to an officer, but there I was, teaching, questioning, probing, prodding, Socratic technique, and grading these guys. And I didn't give out many good grades. But after the course was over, I went on R&R &R with one of the students, went to Taipei. Chance to see Dave and Kenny. Soon after my return from R&R, I found myself sitting on top of a tank in the jungle chatting with Captain Zoltan Zabel, commander of a bunch of tanks and armored personnel carriers. Zabel's men had set up camp for the night, vehicles in a circle pointed outward like the spokes of a wheel. Good defensive position, I was told. Zabo had an Eastern European kind of accent. Captain, mind if I ask where you're from? Hungary. When did you get to the States? 1959. Escaped during Hungarian Revolution. Family in New Jersey sponsored me. <laughs> what are you doing here? I owe it to my country. Wow. Crawls under the barbed wire, barely escapes with his life, manages to get to the States, and promptly says thanks by putting his life on the line. Captain, how do you see your career evolving in the military? My branch is armor. I hope to get back to Europe. If there is World War III, it will be fought there with Tama. <laughs> Properly humbled, I wrote, I wrote an article about Zabo. OK, fast forward. 1988, I'm sitting on a couch in my house in San Jose, California, watching the nightly news on the tube. A guy was arrested as he got off a plane in Miami while traveling from South America to Europe. Case of espionage, biggest at that point since World War II. An organization chart went up on the screen. At the top of the chart, Zoltan Zabo. When I picked my jaw up off the ground, I called the FBI, told them of my brief association with Zabo, sent them a copy of my article. Zabo was not the guy arrested in Miami that day, but he had indeed gotten back to Europe and recruited over a dozen people to copy and carry documents that eventually made their way into the hands of the Hungarian intelligence service and presumably their equivalents in Moscow. Thousands and thousands of pages detailing NATO's plans in the event of a war in Europe. Zabo's top recruit was Clyde Lee Conrad, bright American soldier with a top secret clearance. Conrad was arrested by the Germans in 1988, tried and convicted of espionage and high treason. He died in a German prison at age 50. Another member of Zabo's happy little crew was recruited in Vienna in 1967. 67. So when I met Zabo in 69 in Vietnam, he was already a spy. 
I suppose he was planted on the Jersey Shore. Not too hard to have gotten under the barbed wire under those circumstances. And when he said, I owe it to my country, he was telling the truth. But the bastard was talking about the wrong country. Zabo was eventually arrested and in 1989 convicted by the Austrians of espionage. Never served a day in prison, though, because of his help in exposing Clyde Lee Conrad. Savvy devil, that Zabo. When I got back to the States in January of 70, the end of my military service came quickly. Oakland Army Air Terminal, once again, I filled out some forms, was given a green military dress uniform for a flight back to New York, then bam, out into the night, just about midnight as I recall. My sister and brother-in-law were kind enough to let me stay in their home on Long Island until I made a plan. <laughs> made a plan. I stumbled around without much purpose for a few months. Gave a slideshow about Vietnam at a local library. Thought about teaching. Played some tennis. Drank some martinis at a local gin mill. Then finally admitted to myself that I had to study for the bar again. Did so, passed the exam in New York. As I was settling down, trying to be a good boy, practicing law in Albany, New York, the devil of Norman, Oklahoma, rose up and called me on the phone. Or maybe I called him. In any case, Dave Myers and I decided to go down to New Orleans and visit Kenny, a reunion at Mardi Gras. We flew down there. Kenny picked us up, took us right over to a real estate friend who got us an apartment in the heart of the French Quarter in minutes for just a few bucks. Next morning, Dave and I were out there on the street, each of us with a six-pack tied to his belt. Today, I suppose you'd call that accessorizing. Kenny had become engaged to a lady, and he showed uncommon good judgment when he decided not to join Dave and I in our street activities. And then, down the street, came what seemed like an infinite number of guys dressed in feminine costumes. It was a parade of drag queens. Well, this was 1971 or two. I had never seen such a thing before. I was absolutely shocked. And, and then this one guy, as that parade is passing, he turns toward us. He's all made up, decked out. He had, had a mask on, feathers, sequins, uh, makeup, the whole nine yards. And he turns toward us and he yells out, Hey, Stu! Dave, I, I, I don't know who that is. Oh, sure, Stu. Look, I'm your friend. I, I'll go through this with... David, stop that stuff. Stu, maybe you want to... Take this fellow home to mom at Christmas. David, cut that shit out. I look up and he's gone. Who was that masked man? An old friend? My date from the Augusta nightclub? No, the real estate agent. <laughs> Dave and I flew out of New Orleans late one night. A few days before Mardi Gras ended, our relationship with Kenny's fiancée had become a bit strained. <laughs> we left Kenny in his new world, and that new world had no more room for Fort Gordon and Taiwan. My lawyerly life took a turn as well. Through the late 70s into the mid 80s, I worked for General Electric Company out in San Jose, California. One Memorial Day, I found myself in a small cemetery in the adjacent community of Los Gatos. A veterans group was leading a ceremony there to honor the day and the fallen. Ah, their uniforms looked a bit worn, 
and some of the guys filled them out without a lot of room to spare. But people were there for the right reason. Seems to me Memorial Day has to be about more than only hot dogs and beer, more than just a three-day weekend. People were there to honor those who had given their lives for the rest of us. I felt unusually calm and thankful. In April of 95, I got a call from a producer of the CBS TV show Sunday Morning. Management there had decided to dedicate an entire program to the 20th anniversary of the fall of Saigon and America's exit from Vietnam. Bill Geist, a contributor to the show, noted author and father of Willie Geist, had worked with me over in the public information office in Lai Kay. For Bill's part in this anniversary show, he wanted to visit with some of the guys with, with whom he had served. I was honored to be among the chosen. Bill also visited our commanding officer, then retired and living in Melbourne, Florida. When I saw the TV show, I was jumping up and down like a kid. I wanted to go visit the Colonel. So several years later, when vacationing down that way, I gave the Colonel a jingle, asked if I might drop by. He gave an immediate thumbs up. But what was I going to call him? It had always been Colonel or Sir, Vincent seemed a bit forward, maybe even disrespectful. I went with Sir. When I got to his house, the Colonel introduced me to his wife. Hi there. And then on to cocktails. At the dinner table, the, the Colonel told me that I was one of the nutcases, his word, nutcases, that he had recruited into his unit. <laughs> I was all smiles. To me, that was a badge of honor. The colonel's wife never fully participated in our conversation. Frankly, she didn't have much of a chance to do so. The colonel was barking out orders to her as if she were a private in his own private army. Do this, do that, fill Stu's wine glass, give Stu more pasta. She had a sorrowful look in her eye. And I I thought she was almost asking me for support. I was awfully uncomfortable. As I was leaving, she pointedly invited me to return and visit them the following year if I were in the area. I said I would. Truth is, I've been back that way just about every year, but I have not called the colonel. He was more than kind to me more than generous overseas, but I, I didn't want to feel that sadness again. I didn't want to touch that sorrow. I grew bored in San Jose. A good buddy of mine, Paul Powers, suggested I give my acting and writing a shot in New York City. Paul, he's a wise fellow. That was all the investigation and analysis I needed. So in December of 97, I drove my little rental van across what remained of Route 66 and some other blue highways, finally settling in an apartment in Greenwich Village. The village. Just 2,500 miles or so as the crow flies, but a seismic shift in attitude. Home of the Stonewall Gay Riot in 1969, site of the Violent Squatters Riot in Tompkins Square Park in 1988, definitely not San Jose. Memorial Day seemed to grab a hold of me again. In my building, that day is pretty much a trigger for a long weekend. Lots of bags in the lobby. Talk of Fire Island, Block Island, Shelter Island, a whole lot of islands. If I want to talk about the day itself, I talk to Jerry Cosme, wonderful fellow, works in my building. Jerry's nephew, Air Force, cousin, Marines, Uncle Army Vietnam, other uncle, World War II general. Jerry gets it. An article in the New York Times about Memorial Day caught my eye. The article was about Father Kevin Devine and his Church of the Good Shepherd. Father Devine served as an army chaplain in Vietnam. He was awarded the Silver Star 
for valor, for ministering to soldiers in the field under fire. The Silver Star, our nation's third highest award for valor. Father Divine believed that Memorial Day Mass should honor both God and soldier. I took a subway uptown, found my way to Father's church. Outside, on the steps, veterans in uniform. Again, some pounds got in the way, but who cared? Inside, members of American Legion Post 581 marched down the aisles carrying the American flag, the black POW MIA flag, and a host of others. Tom Hoare, their commander, led the way. Father Divine, thank God for blessings bestowed. He prayed for those who had lost their lives in battle and for those whose fates remained unknown. He walked such a delicate line so gracefully. We sang the battle hymn of the Republic in church and concluded with America the Beautiful. I left the church wiping my eyes. A Jew who hadn't seen the inside of a synagogue in quite a while, holding back tears in a Catholic church. The Catholic church finding a place for the soldier that I have never seen before. Sometimes you go looking for a kindred spirit and sometimes a spirit just finds you. Warm summer night, New York City, 2008 or so, Little Italy. I press my nose up against the window of Florio's, an old Italian restaurant on Grand Street. Rumor had it you could smoke cigars in there, which would have been quite a discovery given Mayor Bloomberg's anti-smoking campaign. I, I opened the door just a touch. The smoke was dense. You could just about squeeze it. And then out of that smoke came Anthony, huge guy, the maitre d'. What can I do for you guys? Master of the obvious, uh, can you smoke cigars in here? Uh, what do you think? Come on in. In we went, my buddy Howard Reed and I, into this oasis. So began my love affair with Florio's. Lawrence Amoroso, the owner, wonderful fellow, strong supporter of our troops. Military photos and memorabilia adorned the walls. If a soldier walked in there during Fleet Week in uniform, no charge. Drinks, meals, no charge. And Larry sent over special boots to Afghanistan at his expense. He felt his boots provided better protection against IEDs than those then being distributed by the military. And he had a clubhouse. He made that out of an apartment that he had upstairs, converted it into a clubhouse for cigar smokers. Well, this was almost like heaven. I introduced some Vietnam vets to the place. We'd go there, have lunch, and then adjourn upstairs for some cigars and post-lunch <laughs> cocktail. One day, it was a Wednesday, I walked into Florio's, wanted to tell Anthony, wanted to say hi to him and tell him how many soldiers we were going to have there for lunch the following Monday. Where's Larry? He won't be coming back. What do you mean? He's at home. Home? He's got cancer. I felt like I was the one who had been kicked in the gut. I looked online for a place that made athletic plaques. Hustled uptown to one of them and, and uh, told the guy my situation. Here's the text and layout for a small plaque. The guy's dying. I need the plaque in two days. He supports our troops. I had that beautiful little plaque in two days. And so the following Monday, I walked into Florio's, passed the plaque around the table so the guys could take a look. Al Smith, Lieutenant, Infantry, Platoon Leader, Army. Chet Brooks, Captain, Air Force Intelligence. Dick Colt, retired two-star Army General. John, the B-52 pilot, and a handful of others. The text was simple. Larry, 
you have cared for those who serve. God bless you. The lunchtime soldiers at Florio's, 17 January 2011. I handed the plaque to Larry's dad. He clutched it to his chest. Didn't say a word. Turns out Larry had just died. Earlier, I spoke of a friend who asked how Vietnam had changed me. I've come to think there are others around me who know more about that than I. Friends, relatives, Vietnam vets, especially the vets. But if asked today, I'd tell my friend that my time over in Vietnam has colored my whole life, made me more appreciative of everything we have here, the freedom, the opportunities, the very reason so many people from other countries still risk their lives to get in here. I tell my friend that my admiration has grown enormously for those who place themselves in harm's way every day so the rest of us can flourish. Cops, firemen, soldiers. 343 firemen left behind at the World Trade Center. Sometimes I still see those guys going up the stairs when everybody else is going down. And, and I have a few questions. Would some form of national service after high school help the young folks of our country grow up? A choice, perhaps, of environmental protection projects, disaster relief assistance, construction of low-income housing, or the military? Would that common background unite the country in shared sacrifice and encourage all of us to think just a little bit harder about the welfare of all as opposed to the welfare of one? When I first got to Vietnam, I had a hope, a, a feeling, a prayer, I suppose, that everything would turn out OK. I'd get back alive in one piece. But toward the end of my tour, when I was getting short, as they say, I grew increasingly skeptical about my invincibility. In fact, I was growing damn scared of the possibility that I might intercept some incoming rocket. When I was so close to the finish line, I really didn't want to die. So in those final days, I spent a lot of time around well-constructed sandbag bunkers. <laughs> and when I heard the unmistakable whine of an incoming rocket, I got my ass flat on the ground or into a bunker without much delay. And I began to think about home a lot. And the plane that would take me there, the Freedom Bird. There was a song that meant a lot to my friends and I back then, Jet Plane. Peter, Paul, and Mary sang it. I'm sure you've heard of it, but perhaps hadn't thought of it in quite this context. Finally, it was my turn to go. I was there at Benoit Airfield, a sprawling air base outside of Saigon, a clearinghouse for those entering and leaving the country, a place of great contrast with the coming and the going. A plane touched down, carrying new troops, snakes, more than 200 faces, some anguished, some expressionless, left the plane and filed obediently into the terminal. Some of them managed plastic smiles, and others didn't bother trying. I felt sorry for those fellas because of the difficult year that lay ahead. But I was damn glad to be getting the hell out of there. Those of us who were leaving boarded the now empty plane. Silently. Wasn't over yet. You never know. The door slammed shut, engines roared, plane taxied, wheels lifted off, and a woman, an American woman, said, 
Gentlemen, this is flight G2B4, our destination, Travis Air Force Base, California, USA. We cheered, we applauded, there was an overwhelming sense of relief, pride, pure joy. No more mud, no more rice fields, no more of the smell of the place. We were going back to the place we called the world. We were going home.